You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 56. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now your host, Dr. Renee Paul Gauthier. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year. I send you my best wishes for a fantastic and rocking 2020. I hope you had a great holiday and break and that you're gearing up for more mindful and awesome music making. I personally had some time to rest, but I also took time to work on some super exciting projects with you guys in mind that I'll share in the coming weeks. So stay tuned. It's so great to be back with you, and I'm beyond excited to bring you a brilliant pedagogical mind and someone I respect so much to begin the year. I'm talking here about the incredible Hans Jorgen Jensen. Professor Jensen is a world renowned pedagogue, and all you have to do is talk to some of his students about him and about the profound positive impact he has on their lives to truly see what an amazing person and teacher he is. He's currently the cello professor at Northwestern University and at the Metamount School of Music. He also teaches and gives master classes and clinics at countless other institutions and festivals around the U.S., Canada, Europe, and Asia. He's the recipient of numerous honors and awards, both as a performer and a teacher. And he's been named Outstanding Studio Teacher of the Year by the American String Teacher Association and was granted a U.S. Presidential Scholar Teacher Recognition Award by the U.S. Department of Education. Professor Jensen has performed as a soloist and recitalist all over the world before dedicating his life to education. His students have won prizes in numerous national and international competitions, and they perform and teach in top orchestras and schools. In our conversation, Professor Jensen shares so much great insight on approaching music making and how to practice. I think you'll find yourself having a really hard time picking up your favorite takeaway like I do. And I'm sure that's one that you'll want to listen to again and again. We also had a little comical moment that I kept in there because it made me laugh so much and I thought you guys might get a kick out of it also. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Professor Jensen's wisdom and I'll catch up with you at the end. Let's go to the show. Professor Jensen, thank you so much for, first of all, allowing me to uh, tag along all day and watch you teach so many wonderful students and for taking the time to sit with me after what's been a really long day of teaching already. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, great to have you here. For all the string players out there, you probably don't need introduction, but I also have some listeners who play wind instruments, a vocalist. So can you tell us a little bit about you, how you got started and where you got to where you are today? Sure. I grew up in Denmark. I'm from Denmark. Both my parents are violinists. My father was concertmaster in a Northern Danish symphony. My mother was also first violinist there. So of course, when I was young, I had to play the violin. But since I had to rebel, of course, I decided to switch to the cello. I was 15 years old when I switched to the cello. And it was much more fun than the violin for me anyway. Mm -hmm. Probably physically, it was much more comfortable. Then I started in Denmark. And uh, when I came to the States, it was in 1974 to study with Leonard Rose at the Juilliard School. And then uh, my first job was after... At that time, I played a lot of solos in, in Denmark with different orchestras and recitals and things. But then my first permanent job was at the University of Houston, where I was professor of cello and then in the chamber music, a string quartet. And after that, in 87, I came to Chicago, where I've been professor here at Northwestern University since then. So that's a long time. It's amazing how fast time goes by. So I used to play a lot of concerts. But then after f some years here, I, I decided I would want to focus really on teaching so I can totally dedicate my brain and my time to uh, teach because but I always tell the students it's important that they play a lot because you have to do both but for me if I have to play concerts I spend so much energy and energy and that that it's, it distracts from my teaching 
but mm-hmm. I do not recommend the students. I say you have to find a balance. If you play a lot, don't teach too much because you see too many problems. I don't think it's good for a performer's mind to see too many problems <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> On the other hand, a lot of people say when they start teaching, then they now understand how they can practice better themselves. So that's also true. So mm-hmm. both things is equally true, I think. That's true. I'm, I've experienced that myself with yeah. teaching taught me so much about practicing oh, better. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. But I guess performing, you need to have that experience of oh, performing before you start teaching. You can't do something really that you haven't done yourself. I believe in that. You have to try everything. The more different things you have experienced as a performer, the more things you can teach. Because if you don't really know what it feels like being on a concert stage, being nervous, feeling the stress, how you practice in the end, the last day before the concert, all of these things. If you haven't lived that yourself, I think it's very hard to teach other people to, to do that and how to go about that. Professor Jensen, it was so great for me to observe you teaching today. And uh, there's many things you said that are leading to the question I'm about to ask you right now. What are some, in your opinion, what are some of the practicing habits of your successful students? Oh, I think I actually have a number of students and I always thought, what is it that they do that's better than others? I think they know how to use time in the most efficient and effective way. And they actually know how to use the little times between things. Sometimes you have maybe 30 minutes or you have 15 minutes. And one of the students uh, many years ago, I said, how come you're much better than all the other kids each week? He said, you know what it is? Sometimes before orchestra, I have 10 minutes and I go practice. I say, how do you spend the 10 minutes? He said, I take one passage and just work on one little thing. Or if I have an audition, I might spend the 10 minutes playing through five excerpts. But I know exactly how to spend the time I have. And he said, every day I find maybe three or four 10 minutes or 15 minutes period that I use and I accomplish something each time. And he said, the other kids, they're always hanging out in the cafeteria for those minutes. So this way I get an hour and a half every day where I'm very efficient, more than the other students. It's not that I practice more, but he said, I think I use the time better. I mean, that's kind of me paraphrasing because he didn't speak about himself like he was better. Mm-hmm. So, but he, what he did was what I said, but he didn't say I'm better and I'm better because he's very unselfish. But the same was here, a student, at school here, they've reminded me they were very, very effective about you and efficient about using time. Mm-hmm. And so they, of course, that also means when they have longer practice period, up to 50 minutes or an hour, they also know how to use time effic- effective there. So they're really good at practicing, mm-hmm. using time, knowing what the right thing to do. So of course, it's it's self efficacy, understanding. But I do it with younger kids. I will tell them, and now I don't have so many younger students, but I used to have really young. I have a few very young ones, but tell them to bring their toy and then actually have the toy. Tell them if it's like like a little rabbit. Or if I had, yes, the student I taught last week in New York, she's like 11 or 12, and that was for the Disney Channel. And then I thought, okay, we have to come up with something fresh. So I said, why don't you tell me your favorite toys? And then she would play a passage and I said, now the rabbit is going to watch your bow angle and the uh, turtle is going to watch for the tilting degree because how much hair you put on the string. And it was amazing how that made her focus thinking about two things at once because she knew afterwards, we're going to ask the rabbits what to, and the turtle what the answer was. So with young kids, but of course with an older person, it's also important you can imagine somebody watching you when you practice and then ask questions. So if you imagine imagine another person, it's a way to look at yourself from the outside. Of course, we all do that, but but doing it as where you actually imagine a person there, that is very helpful sometimes. Because then it's not like yourself, it's somebody else. And you know what to answer usually. Yeah. But they need someone to teach them how to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's so important. And it was so great to see you today. I th- I feel like this is what you were doing. I was witnessing you redirect their attention to the if not the proper thing, at least a different thing. It was kind of uh, directing their attention and their mindfulness in analyzing issues at hand and try to solve it by themselves. So I can see how they can 
take that home and apply that at home. Hopefully yeah, yeah. they do it. <laughs> That's also different that some of the students today are very knowledgeable and know so much. And they're, I've encouraged them to really have strong opinions about everything they do. And then in that case, you direct it more to them. As a student is younger, like with the younger student I was teaching, he's a new student. So then I'm more holding his hand, but still trying to make him understand in the end, he has to become a great practicer because you have one half hour of a lesson and you might have 10 hours or 15 hours or 20 hours of practice. So those hours are really important. Mm -hmm. So I feel as a teacher, it's really the first thing I teach is how to practice because then I can become an effective teacher because they spend the time the right way. And how can they establish those strong fundamentals at home? I mean, it, it, I mean, actually, when I started teaching at Northwestern many years ago, the, the cello students were not so good. So, and I started out some young kids, and after one or two years, they were already really good. So I used to take them to class and play for the college student. I said, see, they've only played like three years, but they're already at a very high level. In that case, the difference between you and them is actually they had a parent involved. Mm -hmm. And I said, you as college student, you have to be your own parent. But the difference is with the parent, they record the lesson and they make the students do it. Sometimes you have exceptionally gifted young kids that can do it on their own. But mostly for younger students, it takes the involvement of somebody at least listening to them, to them at home. And that's what the college students have to learn to do, do on their own. But then, of course, as I, my career grew, I got get more and more advanced students. And when you have really advanced students, they're usually much more sophisticated about practicing. Otherwise, they wouldn't be so good. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So that's kind of a privilege of teaching. But I mean, I love to teach students at any level if they really want to learn. Mm -hmm. But if you have kids or younger people that are not eager to learn, then it's not so much fun. Then, it's, then we have to spend all the time teaching them how to love to learn <laughs> and how to, 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 that's a whole nother process. That's much more difficult. That's difficult sometimes. How could a student go about expanding their music, musicianship? Yeah, I used to think it's amazing that you can teach anything technically, but I had a number of students that was not so musical in the beginning. And then one day suddenly it became really musical. It was, that was like, for me, eye opening. Mm-hmm. And some became fantastic, very, very musical, but they were not like that in the beginning. I mean, as you teach, I teach usually in the beginning, the physical, how the bow works, how the left hand works, posture. So all the physical. So until that really works, I don't spend so much time on, on music because I think if you teach music, but there's like physical hindrances, you're not really free to express. But I'm not a teacher that believe in, okay, I give you the tools and then you know what to do with it because most people don't know what to do with it mm -hmm. because style, even style between different periods or there's so many, the, in the end, the most we teach is really music because that's endless. But physically, I mean, you have how to use a bow, how to play in tune. If you have a good vibrato, that's something... If a person doesn't have a good vibrato, if they don't have a good vibrato, that's really a big restriction. That my dad used to always say that if you have problems with vibrato, your left hand is not free. You can't really move. So the vibrato has to be an integral part of the left hand technique. So if those things are solved, then you can start teaching music. And that's endless. Mm -hmm. But by encouraging expressivity and really feeling the emotion inside the body and really going for it, I think you can develop musicality at the highest level. Mm -hmm. And speaking of this freedom, this musical freedom that you get from um, really acquiring those physical skills, you've written a couple of books already, and uh, I'm a violinist, so I have violin mind. It's fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about these books? Because they cover so many wonderful exercises and also some exercises that we don't see anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, it actually came out of, in the beginning, of a necessity, because I felt the first part of Cello Mind, it's about intonation. The second part is about uh, technique, all the different kinds of strength techniques we use. 
But the first part, I felt sometimes with students that I would spend so much time teaching them how to play in tune. And sometimes I would see students go away and they come back, and then they would play out of tune. I say, how can you start playing out of tune? So I felt people that have great ears instinctively and intuitively learn to play in tune. I know myself, my ears were good, but my dad would many times say, no, the leading tune, make it sharper. No, make that, play that note out of tune on purpose. When you play fast, you have to play the half step even closer. So some of those things was taught, but he actually taught just intonation and Pythagorean intonation, but he didn't really know the theories. And he used to say, by the way, people that really know the theories about intonation usually play really out of tune. That means they can't hear. So actually, when I finished, started Cello Mine, my dad was dying and it was the end of his life. And he had always said, I have to be there with him. So I told him, you know, I've been here now a week. I've worked seven hours. When you're sleeping, I'm working on this book. It's a, then I explained it to him. So he said, okay, I trust you because I know you're really into doing the right thing. He said, make sure that in the end, after people understand the theories, it becomes something that's instinctive and intuitively in their ears because it all has to be in the mind and in the ear. Mm -hmm. But I felt by teaching people the theories that they actually can understand it, then they have a method that they can use to teach their own ears better. And mm -hmm. they never stop. The ear, if people don't have really great intonation, I think it's something they have to work on always. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people get older and actually it starts, the ear starts not hearing or the precision goes. So even then it's good to have a book that you can go back to and teach yourself things. So for me it was just finding a method and also it was really the students together with me that evolved those theories over like maybe over nine, eight or nine years. I start finding all the overtones on the cello, all the sympathetic vibration. And by being able to, I think people with the great ear hear that instinctively. But then when you know what to listen to, you can really train your ear to a high level. Mm -hmm. And with the theory that you're mentioning comes the exercise so that people can really develop the skill to listen better. Absolutely. That's an important part. Mm -hmm. So I would say, yeah, read it, understand it, but you have to practice it and turn it into an ear that is instinctive. And obviously, don't teach. If you have an understand theory and you're playing a strength course and, and the violinist, first violinist is terrific and plays absolutely in tune, don't start preaching to them about <laughs> theories because they don't need to know it. It's mm -hmm. something you use for your own knowledge. Mm -hmm. If you are in a strength course, it, I, somebody told me recently, he actually just was in a strength course that he goes to Rice now and there I'd like, uh, they got second prize in the Carl Nielsen competition. And he wrote me, he said, actually, I understand cello mind now. And we actually used a lot of those uh, concepts when we were practicing uh, with the uh, strength quartet. Mm. This is excellent. This I is used to tell you, don't start preaching to other people. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. And you have a lot of great videos out there too about the book. Oh yeah, I thought that's important mm -hmm. that you show how it goes and not so it's like people can hear and see it, especially hear it. That's really important. And is violin mind similar? To cello violin mind. mind is very much as the first part of cello mind, mm -hmm. but just adapted to the violin. The problem is we don't have all the videos yet, so we have to develop those mm -hmm. because it's still different. But I was curious when you do like this, I call it advanced overtones or sympathetic vibration. When you play, but on the violin, I, I borrowed a violin and then Gregory Kalinowski, who we made it with, he said, yeah, you can find every note. It's up really high. And I, I, I'm 100% sure People with great ears, they hear this instinctively and they, they follow those rules intuitively. My teacher, when I was a kid, he would, I was maybe eight years old and he would sit next to me and make me listen to intervals until they vibrated. Oh, yeah. And yeah, he, yeah. the Tartini tones. Yeah. And yeah, he was yeah. like, do you hear how when the B flat is low, it's it's in it, how it vibrates with the G? Oh, or absolutely. If, yeah, yeah. And that's, then, that's sad. So for me, I never developed the theory. Yeah, yeah, but you had the, you have it in your ear. Me yeah. too, I mean. So that's I, why this is so great for me, is that the, now I can put two yeah, yeah, and two together. Yeah, yeah, I didn't do it. I, I, I could not. Sometimes somebody said, I said, it's the tone, the pitch is flat. He said, no, I like it higher. I said, but it's really flat. He said, how, do you, how can you prove that? So that's what actually made me start reading books about intonation. And then I felt there were several books 
but nobody really explained it totally clearly how it is. Mm -hmm. It took a while to figure that out because I think we everybody uses lots of different ways of listening. Yeah, and I love that about the book that they have both the theories and the exercises because we just don't see both together very often. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Another question I had from watching someone today where you were talking about focus and focus in the practice. How do you think students can ensure that they stay focused while they practice? Yeah, I think it's important to do shorter, uh, set short goals, but also important that they monitor their own state of mind. Because many times, a lot of college students do, they practice, and you see it in the lessons after 15 minutes, they start getting this blank look in the eyes. And he sometimes call it the smart person syndrome. I think it's people that are super intelligent. Sometimes they, they are less patient because they're used to, they can just think it and they know it. In school, I think many times they're sitting in a classroom and they're kind of smarter than the other kids. So they, they just concentrate for a few minutes and then it takes a while for the other Sorry, kids. I couldn't quite hear you. Could you please repeat what you said? I said, you play out of tune. <laughs> That's Siri. I didn't know. She, she, I never used Siri. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> oh, how to the focus? Yeah, yeah. With the focus, <laughs> yeah. I think when people are in, in, super intelligent, I think they're not as patient because I think sometimes in school, I'm talking about like college kids or young college kids, mm -hmm. and they come out of high school. I think one thing is when you take SAT test, everything goes really, really, really fast. Mm -hmm. So I think they're trained to solve problems super fast. But they're not trained in the same way to go really, like, really, really into deep detail with something. I remember once I helped my daughter when she was in high school, or my son. I said, you're not detailed enough. So I made them write this really detailed paper. I think they got a C- minus or something. The teacher said, there's way too many details here. <laughs> But when you're practicing and you want to go into deep behind the scene or behind looking really what is the problem with something, there's no limit to how low you can go. Of course, if you can do it fast and eff effective, it's very good. Mm -hmm. But so I think, so I pointed out, I said, you're losing concentration now because what happens is when they're really fresh, you can solve things really fast. And maybe I keep going too long with the same thing, so that could be a problem. And you see, they can't take it anymore. I have a new student, I teach him with Skype. And after 15 minutes, I said, oh, you're getting frustrated. You're getting frustrated. What are you, because you're, the, when I tell you to fix something, it goes three times slower than just like five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. So probably if it was a young kid, I would change the topic because a young kid, maybe you have to switch every five minutes, depending how, so they don't have to do the same thing so long because a younger person, really younger, have, have less uh, concentration for a long period about the same thing. They need entertainment. So I try to teach a student, how can you entertain your own mind when you practice so it's fun? Mm -hmm. So make it a challenge because we know if something is too easy, you get bored. If something is too hard, but it has to be a way where you kind of make it a challenge. So then it's like you're trying hard, but you're not so hard that you get frustrated. Mm -hmm. So how to keep right at the threshold of what is a challenge. That's really important when you practice. Yeah, it's tricky too because it takes a while to acquire skill. So it's something to understand how to fix a problem But then you also have to acquire the skill that cements it. And that's sometimes where I find that students or myself lack patience is to really take the time to cement it once you understand what the issue was. Yeah, yeah. So I say, can you do it now? Play it now. Can you learn it now? Learn it now. Mm -hmm. or, or no, if you do one or two. Can you not learn it now? How many steps do you need in order to learn it? Do you need three steps or four steps? And should those steps go over like, do you need a week to learn it? Or is that something you maybe need, if you do this now, A, B, C, tomorrow, a few more, and then the third day you can do it. That's like when you really master self-efficacy and you understand how you function. And the better somebody are, the better they know that. But that takes a long time, even daring to think what it will take because they, sometimes they can't do it right now and then they get frustrated instead of, Can you do it now? Do it. Just, sometimes they can actually do it right now if they just 
take all the energy and focus it into one part. I said, just do it right now. Just take a break, one minute, now do it. Oh, I can actually do it. Or you can learn it. I need to do A and B. Now you can do it. Mm -hmm. So I think just stepping back and, and looking at it and seeing how much time it takes or what kind of strategy you have to have. Mm -hmm. So it's really about yeah, being smart about those things. I'm trying to writing a book together with a doctor's student. Yeah, we are writing a book called Practice Mind. Mm. So it's about practicing. That sounds like a book I'll be buying. No, no, it's a very interesting <laughs> book. But I try to do look at it each topic. I try to find out what does science know about these things. Mm. And then I put my knowledge, try to put what I know inside something that also can be proven. Of course, I can prove it by having done it, but I like to have that it relates to something that's more objective. Mm -hmm. So goal setting, I have like three different theories of goal setting I talk about. I still put it into kind of how I think it should be done, but we get reference from like theories of goal setting. Or I have a chapter I wrote, the science of practicing. What do we know about these things? And uh, that's very interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. And when is this coming out so I can buy it? <laughs> uh, no, it'll be finished in the end of next summer. Mm -hmm. Well, it takes a while. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll be looking for it. Do you have a favorite tool in the practice room? Oh, there's so many tools depending on 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 each each person. But I think for students, it's really. setting short goals mm -hmm. that is like really short goals and also really separating drilling and practicing from performing it's really important when we practice that we say now we are performing and we are practicing when when you perform the only thing you can do is play the best you can play at this moment but don't second guess it but if you do the best you can when you perform that's all you can do at that moment And there's no space and time to really second guess yourself too much. Mm -hmm. And that's thing that's hard. People don't do enough of practice performing, where you just do the best you can. Mm -hmm. That's every concert. People play as good as you can. Next day you can make it better. Next day better. That's what at least what people hope for. But it's important to know what's the best you can do right at this moment, and then not second guess yourself. And what's a skill outside of playing their instrument that you think musicians should expand on to become better artists? Yep, that's of course reading a lot of things about many other things. The more you know about other topics, I think not just being like uh, focused on your own instrument. And I think it's important when people play like Beethoven sonatas, really know a lot of other works of Beethoven really listening to other, the other instruments. And of course, people always talk about it's important to go to to museum, but it's really important sometimes to see music also within the culture of that of that period and also from that point of view of in that country. Because still today, I think many times, if you have people, we are very international, but I think still Russian musicians very often play Russian music really, really, really fantastic. Same with French. The sensitivity of the French language and the French culture, and of course, also that gives you a special feeling. So I think it's important that we really think about the cultures surrounding all the music and the period. And then it makes you play the music better, I think, if you look at it from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Not just very, very focused on just the music. That's not enough. So it's important to have a big vision. That's a good one. Professor Jensen, what is the best advice that was ever given to you that you would like to pass on to the listeners? Oh, that's hard to say. Uh, I mean, I always tell students, just go for it now. Don't hold back. Don't second guess anything, I think. But my advice was I learned so much from my father about, he was really great about uh The skills about practicing. Are you thinking about not practicing just anything with music? Anything. I remember when I was very young, what really inspired me the most was when I heard first time, I was, I think I was only six or seven, 
I heard Tosca and experienced that. Mm. And at that time, they had like every other day they played a different opera. With this, they had a opera company that came, and they, this or- my parents' orchestra just put on the music for all these operas. Of course, they had a few weeks of rehearsal, but then it was like two days for one opera, two days for another. Mm. Just sitting there and watching that because there's nothing like when you see the drama in opera. It's so everything is there: the words, the drama, and I think having that feeling for music that you get from opera but having it into in a, in a concerto because it's it's a, there's as much emotions and there's ma- as many feelings but it's just not as obvious as when you see it related to a theater or play also mm-hmm. so i think that's important that we inside the music have a story that we can tell that's similar to going to an opera mm-hmm. and that's another person can't tell you what to think that's something you have to find inside yourself what the music means to me or to you. But it's important to relate it back to, of course, what the composers felt. But it's still up to the person performing to make that interpretation. Mm, That's really great advice. And finally, do you have a quick actionable tip that the listeners could implement today in their practice room? As I said before, I'm writing a chapter now about creative practice ways inspired by science. There's one called the Constraint Action Hypothesis. This hypothesis proposes that when performers utilize an internal focus of intention, of attention, focus on their movements, they may actually constrain or interfere with automatic control processes that would normally regulate the movement. Whereas an external focus of attention, focus on the movement effects, allows the motor system to more naturally self-organize. A great number of experiments have been done in a great variety of disciplines from hitting a golf ball to a target, shooting a basketball, doing long jumps to playing a musical instrument. There is overwhelming evidence that focusing on the effect that their movements produce rather than on the movements themselves make the performances much more accurate. So for musicians, if you think about, we teach, you know, when we teach, oh, you should shift like that or do that. If you think about the muscles and the movements being used is not as effective as when you think about the music, what you feel in your mind, the music you hear in your mind, and the music that comes from the instrument. So how you entrain the inner feeling of music with the outer feeling, not the outer feeling, but the outer sound that comes from the instrument. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding that is really important. And I wish sometimes when I was younger, I would have known that because I would just have trusted my own instinct much better. So I think that's really a concept that I think is really great. It's kind of like associating a sound that we hear in our head with the motion that executes that sound. Yeah, but we, we, we focus on the sound and the movements will take care of themselves. For instance, when we in uh, lift, weightlifting, if we lift up, it, it's always, we always told, do it slow and, and with even speed. Because if you do it fast, you just hit it or you just push hard, then you use a ballistic motion. Mm-hmm. Ballistic motion is where you initiate the movement and then inertia carries through. So you're not using your muscle all the way. And we, many times when we shift, we do that. We just shoot the arm, but we don't. We shouldn't worry about it. Just trust that you hit the note that you're going to do. And if you don't interfere, you just hit that note. Mm-hmm. Of course, with shifting, we should always be able to shift really slow and control it. Also, another thing with practicing that... Uh, that I like the science about is block practice versus random practice. Mm-hmm. Whereas we know that if you, when you repeat something many times in a row, 10 times in a row, the same thing, then right after you have more accuracy. But if you do random practice, let's say you used to learn five different things. If you then would do one thing one way and the other skill another way, and then mixing them up, then if you do that the same amount of time as as a block practice, when you test right after, you don't perform as well, but when you test a week later, you perform better. So it's important that musicians learn to mix it up. So right before a concert, it's better to just like uh, take a passage that's difficult, maybe do it four or five times in a row, just to make it a little bit slow, a little bit faster and tempo. So I think understanding those things is really helpful. Mm. Professor Jensen, thank you so much again for this gift of your time. It's great what you're doing. It's fantastic. Keep it up. Thank you. (laughs) 
Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with cellist and pedagogue Hans Jorgen Jensen. I have put links to his incredible books and to the Cello Mind YouTube videos in the show notes. So I hope you'll take a second to check them out because there is a lot of valuable information there. Like I said earlier, there were so many points he touched on that really resonated with me. And it's very hard for me to pick one favorite takeaway. But I think I'll go ahead and bring up what he says about how mindfully using time can have a dramatic impact on our playing and being absolutely mindful while practicing, finding pockets of time to practice and accomplishing something, making the most of the available time, thinking of solving issues instead of mindless repetition, being intentional about time management within a practice session, thinking about problems when we're not with our instruments and just going on about our life. All of those things really add up And they compound like interest and they really bring faster progress and better results, both in the practice room and on stage. So it really is up to us to, like he said, find these moments when we can practice and think about our music making, like the student's story that he mentioned. When can we take five minutes and ponder on a problem? Maybe we can take a few minutes at the beginning of a rehearsal to do some slow scales and practice on our vibrato. All of those things, like I said, really add up. I think we tend to forget the other definition of the word practice. Yes, there's the action of practicing, but there's also approaching our art as a practice, as something that lives with us, as something ongoing, a long-term process. We can have a brilliant idea on how to fix a passage while driving to work or how to shape a phrase while reading a great passage in a book, or I don't know, you get the idea. We are musician. We are artists and sometimes we pick up our instruments and we work on our craft yes but the practice of music making never leaves us and is always a part of us and everything that we experience feeds that I hope that makes sense uh, I would love to know what your favorite takeaways from today's show was so please get in touch with me I mind over finger on both Instagram and Facebook And of course, you can find me at mindoverfinger.com where you can read the show notes, find more information about mindful and deliberate practice, and make sure to visit my resource page at mindoverfinger.com slash resources, where I've put links to all my favorite tools and CDs and books, as well as the books recommended by my guests here on the podcast. And if you're looking for a community of mindful practice enthusiasts, consider joining the Mind Over Finger tribe. This is my private Facebook group where I'll be popping in once a week to talk about mindful practice and answer your questions. And we're also going to be starting the Mind Over Finger book club with The Inner Game of Golf by Tim Galway. You might remember that Nathan Cole talked about how it changed things for him in episode seven. So we're going to read it and study it and apply it in our practice and talk about it together. So get the book and join the tribe at Facebook slash groups slash Mind Over Finger tribe. And let's get in the flow together. And because I like to make things as easy as possible for you guys, I will, of course, have all these links in the show notes. That's all I have for you guys today. Again, thank you and a bientôt.